All right, so now we begin to introduce this idea of well-posedness of a initial value problem. And again, uh, we're looking at a case uh, y prime is equal to f of ty, and there are some initial data y uh, t0, y t0 is equal to y0. So this is the setting which we're looking at. Um, and the basic idea, if you will, it's like behind this is that you have um, initial data, right? So your initial data here is in some sense uh, both the initial time t0 uh, and the initial value y0, okay? Um, so for fixed t0 and y0, you have a, a particular solution. Uh, and well posed this, it's like um, speaks to the question of how that solution varies uh, as you vary, as you change t0 and y0. Okay, so in particular, uh, for a uh, problem, initial value problem to be well posed, it's like you want sort of uh, two things. Uh, the first of which is that uh, solutions sort of depend continuously on the initial data. Okay. Uh, and the second which, which is obviously closely related, uh, is that small changes in the initial data result to correspondingly small changes uh, in the solution, okay? Okay, so this is sort of uh, an intuitive level, it's like what uh, one means, it's like when you say the initial value problem uh, is well posed, is that obviously you need solutions uh, to exist and to be unique, but in addition to that, you want to see how these solutions change uh, as you vary this initial data, which includes both the initial time uh, and the initial uh, value of y it's like at that time, okay? So let me state the theorem um, for this. And maybe let's sort of put it towards the bottom so I can then develop the proof uh, up on top. So the theorem is as follows, okay, that um, suppose you have two solutions, y of t and z of t, um, which satisfy the initial value problem, okay, uh, but for slightly different data. Um, y prime is equal to f of t y um, and y at t zero is equal to y zero. Um, so we're, we're just actually going to consider what happens if y zero changes in this case, right? And then z prime is equal to f of t z, right? And z at t zero is equal to z zero, which is defined to be y zero plus some small change delta, okay? Then, uh, and we want that F is Lipschitz continuous. In Y, and that T is an interval from A to B. All right, okay. Then uh, for all T in the interval from A to B, Right, the difference between y and z in absolute value, z of t minus y of t is less than equal to e to the Lipschitz constant L times t minus t zero uh, multiplied by the absolute value of delta zero. Uh, and, and that delta zero is just the difference in value between y zero uh, and, and z zero. Okay, so again, L is the Lipschitz constant. Okay. 
Okay, so what that's saying is that if there's a slight change in the initial data, right, then um, the difference it's like between these two solutions. So if you have sort of two nearby solutions, right, at y zero and z zero at initial time, right, that error, right, only grows can only grow so fast, right. So this thing is bounded from above, right, by e to the l times t minus t zero uh, times this initial gap, right, which is delta zero. Okay, so that's that's basically what this theorem is saying, right? That small changes, it's like take uh, also sort of stay small. It's like uh, with a growth rate which depends uh, exponentially. It's like in time, it's like uh, but with a <coughs> sort of growth rate, it's like which depends on the Lipschitz constant. Okay, so let's try to prove this. Okay. Um, So if you have y of t is equal to y0, okay, so I'm just writing down um, the fundamental theorem of calculus, right? We know that y of t is equal to y0 plus integral from t0 to t of f of s, uh, y of s ds, right? And you also know that z of t is equal to z0 plus the integral from t0 to t of f of s zs ds. Okay, and so we can take the difference of these two things. It's like to give you uh, sort of the growth rate of the difference, right? Because we're trying to establish an estimate uh, z of t minus y of t in any case. So let's look at z of t minus y of t, right? So z0 minus y0 by definition <coughs> is delta 0, right? So this is delta 0 plus the integral from t0 to t of f of s. Um, z of s ds minus the integral t0 to t of f of s uh, y of s ds. Okay, now we uh, um, obviously the solution, or I mean the bound we end up getting depends on the Lipschitz constant, so that's sort of obviously suggestive that you want to take advantage of the uh, Lipschitz continuity at some point, right? So you have uh, an ample opportunity here because the integrand involves f of s, uh, z of s, and f of s, y of s, right? So only the y value is different here. So we can use the Lipschitz continuity um, in, um, in the y variable of f, right? The uniform Lipschitz continuity. But in order to do that, we have to, um, we have to take absolute values of this. Right, so we get absolute values of z of t minus y of t, right, is equal to the absolute value of this thing. Let me write it this way, s of z of s minus f of s, y of s, ds, absolute value. Then we have the triangle inequality. This is less than equal to uh, absolute value of delta zero plus um, absolute value of the integral, right? Okay, and of course you know that the absolute value of the integral is bounded from above by the integral of the absolute value. So this is uh, integral from t0 to t of the absolute value of f of s, zs minus f of s, ys, ds. All right, and then now, actually, sorry, the ds is outside the absolute value. And then now you're ready to apply the uh, Lipschitz continuity condition, right? Now this is the absolute value of the difference of these things, right? Where the only difference between where you evaluate f is in the second slot. Okay, so this is less than equal to delta zero plus the integral from t zero to t of l times uh, z of s minus y of s, right? So going from here to here, it's like you use this uniform uh, Lipschitz continuity estimate, okay? 
All right. So so now it's like you need to you need to say something about this. Okay. So let me just uh, record that last inequality and then uh, start from fresh. We know the absolute value of z of t minus y of t is less than equal to the absolute value of delta zero uh, plus the integral from t zero to t of l z of s minus y of s absolute value ds. Okay. All right. So now I want to figure out how to make more precise sense of that uh, right hand side or bounded in some way. Okay, so let phi of t be equal to this integral from t0 to t of z of s minus y of s ds. So I'm going to write down a differential equation for this quantity basically, uh, and that's going to then tell me some of what I need to know. I can differentiate that, so I can differentiate phi of t t, um, and of course when you differentiate an integral, uh, you just get the integrand, so this is the absolute value of z of t minus y of t. Okay, so, um, so that's telling you, and that's of course the left hand side, so now I have a differential inequality as opposed to a differential equality, equation. Right, so the differential inequality is that phi prime of t, which is of course the absolute value of z of t minus y of t, is less than equal to this Lipschitz constant of phi of t, right, plus um, the absolute value of delta zero. So here I've swapped the order of these two terms, right, but nevertheless it's like you end up with an equation which looks like this. Okay, so. Uh, Right, so the way to sort of think about this, this modulo, it's like this initial uh, delta zero. This is obviously just looks like some sort of, um, and in modulo, the inequality, right? If it was an equality, this would be something like this um, <coughs> sort of exponential growth type behavior. Um, but again, there's an initial source of error, and then uh, it's not an equality, but an inequality. Okay, so, um, but if you, ignore that and if you pretended that you had an equality, right, if we had equality instead of an inequality, right, the solution would be following, right, phi of t is equal to absolute value of delta zero uh, divided by L, and then e to the L t minus t zero minus one. Okay, all right. Um, so uh, you can do this using a simple application of the variation of parameters formula. It's like applied to, to this problem, right? because you know the fundamental solution of the part without this uh, term here. Okay, but, um, but the point, if you will, is that, um, you know, you can use this um, term, it's like as a, basically a lower bound to, um, you know, it's like, oh, sorry, yeah, you can use this, it's like as a, um, as a bound, it's like on, on the solution, okay. Um, uh, well, actually, it's an upper bound, okay, and um, and the way to sort of think about this is that the rate of change is bounded from above by this thing, and all these terms are positive, right? So basically, what's happening is that if you have equality, that's growing at the maximum possible rate. It's like, and any time you have the in the strict inequality instead of equality, the solution is growing slower than the solution of the initial value problem where you had an equality here, okay. So that tells you basically that this phi of t satisfying this inequality is bounded from above. It's like by <coughs> the solution of this equation where you've replaced the inequality with an equality. Okay, so this is what is called Gronwell's inequality. Sorry, Gronwell's inequality. It says that phi of t 
is less than or equal to delta zero, absolute value delta zero, um, divided by L. And uh, <coughs> e to the t, t minus t zero minus one. Okay. And, um, but of course, phi of t is z of t minus y of t. So, <coughs> sorry, phi prime of t is uh, z of t minus um, l, y, sorry, z of t minus y of t. So, okay, so z of t minus y of t in absolute value is equal to phi prime of t. I know what this is, okay. <coughs> so I can differentiate that. Well, actually, um, let me just write down the inequality. It satisfies pointwise, right? So this is less than or equal to L phi of t plus delta zero. Okay. So, um, so right. So L times this is. Uh, so this is less than or equal to L times absolute value of delta divided by L e to the L t minus t zero minus one plus absolute value of this, right? And that's equal to absolute value of delta e to the L t minus t zero. Okay, and then the delta zero absolute value is canceled out by this minus one multiplied into, again, the absolute value of delta term, right? <coughs> so, so that allows you to conclude that the absolute value of z minus y is less than equal to the absolute value of delta zero times e to the l t minus t zero, which is exactly this inequality which uh, we wanted to show, okay? All right, so again, the upshot of this is that um, um, if you have a initial value problem where the um, sort of the right hand side um, f satisfies uh, this uniform uh, Lipschitz continuity condition, it's like in the z and y direction, right? Uh, then the difference in the uh, a small change, it's like in the initial value uh, of the problem, um, sort of grows. But it grows at a sort of a, at a controlled rate, uh, which depends on the Lipschitz constant uh, in the uh, of the f, uh, the right hand side. It's like uh, in the y direction. Okay, so um, and so this is again this question of well posedness that basically says again that if you have a small change in the initial data, then there's uh, you know it's like that change, um, you know it's like. Um, only grows in a, in a sort of a very controlled way. It's like, which depends again on this Lipschitz constant. Okay, so, so let me just uh, stop here. It's like, and then the next thing we'll talk about is uh, developing numerical methods for distribution initial value problems.